the final question mark episode of the bat ass podcast the batman the animated series show podcast where we talk about batman the animated series we've made it to the end my name is clay mccormick and with me as always is sean how are you doing sean man is is there any way to contact an ex-girlfriend through social media out of the blue oh boy and not come across as creepy <laughs> uh go on <laughs> I'm so not. I mean, I met my wife before, you know, internet was d- dating online and all this stuff. And mm-hmm. I'd never been on Facebook or social media except for like Twitter, which I quit. Yeah. And Instagram now. And I've never gone through that rabbit hole of like, oh, I wonder what my exes are doing. I've never done that um, because I don't have a Facebook account. I can't search stuff and it's just not easy for me to do that. And only recently did I try that out, and I've basically been going through the the learning process that you all went through back in 2005 mm-hmm. <laughs> when you all joined mm-hmm. Facebook, you know? <laughs> and I'm realizing now that uh, it might not have been such a good idea to reach out to these people because there's inevitably it just feels like I'm, you know, asking for something that I'm not, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Happy anniversary, by the way. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. I mean, I so one uh, ex girlfriend and friend reached out to me out of the blue, and she's married, and she's like, I know that she's on the up and up. Like, I don't question her integrity sure. at all. So I'm like, oh, maybe I should reach out to a few of my exes or whatever. And uh, two of them are not responding at all. And now I'm not sure if I'm supposed to like unfollow them or <laughs> apologize and back off. Like, I don't know what the, the procedure is right now. Uh, I think generally, <laughs> if you're gonna throw that out there, you just you just throw it out there and then you wait. I wouldn't I wouldn't press it. This sucks. I don't like not being in the position of power. And now yeah. I've got mm-hmm. these. <laughs> right. mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Welcome to social media, I guess. Uh, I don't know how we all made it this far, man. <laughs> you know, my friend made a good uh, analogy the other day. He goes, you know, the prime directive in Star Trek where you're not supposed to interfere with these other cultures because new technology might fuck up a culture that's not ready for it. Yes. It feels like aliens gave us Facebook. And that's the warfare that they're that, that they're that's the virus that they gave us that's imploding us basically. Yes, yeah, yeah. Social media is definitely a violation of the prime directive. I will I will I will agree with that. Um, All right. Back anyway, to Batman. anyway. Uh, yeah, we have we have hit the end of the of the series as it stands, Batman the Animated Series and the new Batman Adventures. We are covering today the last two episodes, Beware the Creeper and Judgment Day. So uh, we may as well jump into it. We'll take a quick break, and we will come back and talk about Beware the Creeper. Seven years ago, this very night, the clown prince of crime, the Joker, was born on this spot. Since then, Gotham has repeatedly been rocked by the attacks of this criminal madman. Who is he? Where did he come from? What diabolical scheme is he plotting even now? I'm Jack Ryder. Join me as we answer these questions and more on joker the madness behind the laughter all right beware the creeper story by rich fogel teleplay by steve gerber directed by dan reba and in this one exposure to a weird mixture of chemicals including the joker's laughing gas changes straight-laced newsman jack Ryder into the crazed creeper he looks to kill he looks to kill the joker and develops a much unwanted crush on harley Hmm. um How, how did you feel about this one? I remember watching this one when it was first on, and I really yeah. did not like it. I was surprised by how much I actually enjoyed this. Yeah. This time, uh, I, I liked th- it a lot more than I remembered before. Same here. Uh, I should have looked this up, but when they were doing season four, this season that we're finishing, were they going to do a Batman um, family um, approach Meaning, get the creeper in at the beginning of the season and have him be part of the Bat family because I remember seeing some sketches of Batman, Robin, Bat, Cow, sorry, Batgirl, and the creeper in it. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, I don't know. Uh, again, I should have looked this up. But I felt like they were at one point they were trying to push the Creeper as a new addition to the Bat Family, but he only got this one episode. Uh, I'm not sure because I uh, the li- the order that we're doing, I believe, is production order, and right. this is the second to last episode. So if that if they were trying to do that, they took their sweet time getting to it. Yeah, no, that's what I mean. Is like before they launched into the, making this third season, oh sure, fourth sure. season, that they had this. Uh, yeah, my book's too. Uh, I can't reach it from where I'm sitting. Never mind. It doesn't uh, <laughs> on the on the trivia on IMDb. It doesn't make any mention to that. So uh, okay. it's possible. Um, I didn't I didn't see it anywhere, and it didn't. It hasn't mentioned it on uh, on Wikipedia, yeah. but it might be in the book somewhere. I'm not sure. Yeah. But well, yeah. Uh, what do you wh- what do you how do you feel about the creeper in, in this episode in general? And as a kid, I remember thinking this is silly and dumb, and I like my Batman more serious. And I just it was easy for me to dismiss. But knowing more about storytelling now, I can kind of see the appeal of a Joker versus Joker battle in Gotham. Like Joker's got someone on his turf who's not necessarily a bad guy. He's just fucked up in different kinds of ways. And he's like challenging the Joker by stealing his axe, stealing his girl. Like there's a lot to farm here, which I I, I think that they touched on some nice beats. Um I don't know if it's an all-timer for me, and it's not my type of episode, but I can't deny that it's pretty solid. Yeah, uh, just quickly, it says on uh, Wikipedia that the Creeper was at one point considered for a DC Animated Universe series of his own, but the concept oh. was eventually reworked into the series into the series with an original character called Freakazoid. I remember Freakazoid, but uh, uh, that kind of makes yeah. sense. It's, it's, it's a pretty straight line, I think, uh, between the two of those. Yeah. I liked Freakazoid a lot. Uh, that is definitely a better version of the Creeper. Now yeah. that you're saying that out loud, yeah. I I don't really know much about the cre- the Creeper. Ke- seems to be one of those characters that pops up from time to time, and I can never yeah. understand why people like using him so much because I've never really found him that interesting, or I, I guess I never really knew what yeah. he was about. And just looking him up on on Wikipedia, it it seems like. DC Comics doesn't really know what he's about either because every time he shows up, they re- they change his backstory in some way and yeah. make him weirder or yeah. or, uh, or something. Mm-hmm. Uh, originally, they... originally, he transformed into the Creeper by activating a device that granted him superhuman abilities while also causing his face to be covered in yellow makeup. <laughs> it's a very specific set of uh, reactions. Yeah, like, <laughs> like it's... It, it it feels like a like a, a superhero device that got, went wrong or something where you hit the button and it it splashes you in yellow paint, turns your hair green, and then puts this giant red mane on your yeah. back, and it's like okay, go fight crime now. Yeah, and then uh, in uh, in they redid him again after Crisis, where he. Uh, I can't remember exactly uh, uh, where it was still a. Uh, in 1987, it was said Ryder suffered an actual slight change in personality when he became the Creeper, as the device not only empowered him and dressed him in a costume, but also altered his brain chemistry. In 1997, uh, Ryder and the Creeper are treated as two personalities sharing the same body. In 2006, 2007. Uh, presented a new origin, starting with the story Rider's Transformation no longer involved a costume and was now depicted as a physical transformation into a yellow-skinned, green-haired superhuman with a different face, voice, and body, and a red mane of fur sprouting from his shoulders and back. Starting in the 90s, his laugh was able to cause pain or immobility in enemies. In New 52, short-lived incarnation was a villain... And he was a demon who inhabited human hosts. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he's shown he sh- he's popped up from time to time in different uh, media. He's been on. Uh, he was in Justice League briefly. He, uh, Jack Ryder shows up in the Arkham games as Jack Ryder, but not the Creeper. Um, I, yeah, I don't know. I guess I never really he never really landed with me as a character. Mm. Yeah. Um, and, but I did like this one more than I thought I was going to. Uh, I think it's right. pretty fun. It probably has the dirtiest joke in, in the entire series in it. Oh my god! Yeah, I was going to bring up the uh, pie. <laughs> yeah, pie joke. yeah, that was. Uh, everyone always references. Uh, don't you want to rev up your Harley? But nobody remembers the. <laughs> Do you want to try my pie line? Yeah, yeah, that was pretty. Uh, it happened to be a cream pie too. I will point that out. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I think that's I the joke, Sean. <laughs> <laughs> Just telling you that there are layers. Uh-huh, yes. Uh huh. Yes. 
So I got my Batman animated book that is hard to find, apparently, and I, I got the page open. There are two illustrations that uh, Bruce Tim did. It, they were going to call this last season Gotham Knights. Oh, really? Okay. So they call it, yeah, and uh, despite the... Illust- we were, all right, so I'm going to read from the caption. We were going to call the new show Batman Gotham Knights, but lost out to the more descriptive new Batman Superman adventures. We also introduced Steve Ditko's manic comic creation, The Creeper, into the series, there's a lot of commas in the sentence. Though contrary <laughs> to these Bruce Tim logo illustrations, he did not become a regular part of the Bat Team. But I guess it was tossed around at one point that he would be part of the Bat Team. Sure, sure. And uh, yeah, there's another bit in there too, but I don't feel like we need to keep reading to people. <laughs> um. Yeah. I mean, I feel like you... I, I my, When I was watching this, I thought, Clay must be really liking this one because it's different... It's tackling stuff other episodes don't tackle. It's a whole like Joker versus Joker type of thing going on too. Like it's just seemed to me like you would really like this one. I'm surprised that you're not more taken with it. I uh, I think it always even when I was a kid it felt like it was trying to be a spin-off or something and I didn't hmm. really care for it in that sense. Yeah. And it also like yeah. I don't know, it feels a little bit lazy for me to to just be like, "Hey, remember how the Joker turned into the Joker? This guy is the same thing yeah. happened except now he's different." Uh, and but it also, knows what it's doing too. Sorry. Yeah, and also, Batman is awful in this episode. He, <laughs> when he shows up to save Jack Ryder, has he ever failed as badly as he fails trying to save Jack Ryder? Which moment? Oh yeah, when, when he shows up at the chemical. When yeah, when he shows up at the chemical factory and he, yeah. Joker throws <laughs> him into the chemicals. Batman doesn't save that. Then Joker blows him up while he's in the chemicals, and he doesn't yeah, save that. He, he dunks the guy in like three times. There's this ongoing gag, uh, and Batman is confronting Joker, and Joker's like, "You sure you want to go after me and not the guy drowning out in the reservoir?" And Batman, like, sadly, begrudgingly turns around and is arrives outside to see the last of uh, Jack Ryder's jacket going up in flames in yeah. the acid. Somehow. And then, <laughs> and then later in the episode, the 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 creeper and Joker are in a car chase, and Batman's like just hanging onto the back of the car for dear life, while Robin is. Yeah. Uh, Street yeah. street surfing behind, and it's he's just not very effective in this one. <laughs> I think it had that really fun bunch of gags, though. Like that yeah, movie, yeah. it's it's a mad, 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 mad world, or something like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I I actually I thought the car chase was great. I really liked the car chase. Yeah, the uh, creeper being in Joker's car and fiddling with buttons might be the scene that I might draw. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the uh, you know, all those rockets going out the back, and they didn't. None of them hit Robin. Yes. Is a fucking miracle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's then he put Batman grabs onto the back of the thing, and the rockets come out. And yeah, he's he's just it's a bad day. He's had this yeah. season has been full of bad days for Batman, where he's just not on his A game, <laughs> and it causes uh, catastrophic results. Yeah, yeah. What did you think of uh, Harley's reaction to the creeper? I thought the Harley and Creeper stuff was fun. It got a little bit too rapey, I think, <laughs> towards the end. You mean when he falls asleep unconscious between her boobs? Yeah, and he was, you know, he was, <laughs> it felt like they were really going uh, full Pepe Le Pew with him as far as how grabby he was being and all the yeah. comments he yeah. was making and whatnot. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I, I thought, uh, I, I liked, I was glad that she was involved because um, I, I I really like again the idea that Joker doesn't give a shit about what mm-hmm. she's up to because he's too focused on this other stupid Batman stuff. Yeah. Like it's it's obviously <clears throat> much like in Mad Love, it's a very, it's a fairly uh, shockingly yeah. abusive scene the way that he treats her. But as far as the Joker's mindset, I, I appreciate it. I think it, it works for him. Yeah, yeah. Um, I do you feel like with the Creeper they were trying to make him like jim carrey oh definitely like this was the era yes yeah, absolutely it was definite definite uh jim carrey almost yeah. almost impression there was even a, a shot where the camera was close to the ground and the creeper comes out into an alley and he's sniffing for clues or something and he sniffs the camera and there was like i think there was a shot like that in pet detective with jim carrey oh really was yeah there? There, i think so yeah something like yeah. that yeah like he almost looked at the camera and broke the fourth wall in that that scene yeah and then unfortunately they were a few years late because at that point jim carrey was like i'm serious now i make serious movies yeah i know man well you can't we can do a whole podcast for what what went wrong with jim carrey <laughs> I, well, actually maybe, maybe that was that i think he was easing into the the serious stuff that might have been like 
right around was, Truman Show was Truman that ninety eight? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Truman Show, which still did have comedic elements, like that, really was a great movie for Jim Carrey. Yes, yeah, yeah. And then he went too far into the serious stuff with uh, oh man, what's that one that my gothy ex girlfriend used to make me watch? Where he's like Eternal Sunshine, of oh the yeah, mind or whatever. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, I was I always liked that one. I I only saw it once when it came out, but I liked it quite a bit. Oh, it was good, but when your fucked up girlfriend watches it literally every other day it, in the background while you're trying to work, it's like, it'll it'll kill any movie. Yeah, yeah. Did you bring that up when you messaged her on Facebook? <laughs> no, I'm not reaching out to that one. That's that's a bad <laughs> idea. Even I know that. <laughs> um, the the other thing that's really, what it, that is really cool about this episode, though, is uh, apparently it's one of the only times they reference Mask of the Phantasm in DC continuity, because the... Hmm pictures that they're showing and the history they give on the joker is taken from oh, yeah. mask of the phantasm yeah when he was a uh gang member uh for the Velestras and yeah uh, you know it's funny when i did my white knight history of the joker i gave him a more definitive background but all i did was use what was created in this series mm-hmm. including you know that movie like i didn't think it was a big deal to have joker be a, a hitman for the Velestra family and possibly have a, a waning comic uh, stand-up career mm-hmm. on the side like that's that's not new ground that's just what we've all thought about the joker anyway right yeah um, yeah that's kind a of handful of readers didn't like the joker had a definitive past they liked him to be kind of a ghost and his past is always changing or whatever oh sure yeah i know i you, i would count myself in that group i've never joker and wolverine i don't think you should ever really know what what they're about um but yeah, i mean as yeah. far as if you're gonna pin it down yeah you, you're just using stuff that's already been laid out and just sort of like picking and choosing stuff that's already been established so i, I don't think right. it's i don't think it's that big of a deal yeah um the i did did you notice that the dramatization that they show with the uh that like <laughs> 1940s looking batman <laughs> yeah is I, I it felt like the the beginning of that dramatization was very close to the axis chemical sequence of batman 89 mm-hmm. with the way that they, they have the shadows walking through uh the chemical building yeah. and stuff i thought it was very similar yeah. Um, also, and I know this is a little bit late to point this out. Every time they show the chemical vats in these the show, there's always a catwalk going right over it. Yeah, and they're just, just open top. Like, <laughs> yeah. Like, what kind of engineer thought that this was a good idea? Mm-hmm. Like, if you had just built these factories to code and put the catwalk somewhere else, both Two Face and Joker would never have been created. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Well, what about? I mean, they even did it in the new James Bond movie when he gets to that thing at that island at the end. There's like catwalks yeah. over the open pools of viruses and stuff. Yeah. Man, I wanted to like that movie more. <laughs> yeah. I liked. I thought. I thought a section of it was great, um, but yeah. overall, I. I mean, I would comfortably say it was the third best of the the Daniel Craig ones. Yeah. We have. Um, Kerry Fukunaga <clears throat> is going to do Tokyo Ghost after, so I, I really can't say much about the Bond. But uh, yeah, I was surprised at the ending, honestly. I was kind of impressed. Like, whoa, okay, they did that. All right. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I don't want to talk about that in case anybody hasn't seen it yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Um, um, did you, uh, I sort of felt like uh, you would have would want to draw the, the flashback dramatization section of this. Yeah, that would be pretty fun. I hadn't really thought about it. Um, but well, the minute I saw the dopey cowl, I'm like, shit, that's what Clay's answer is going to be yeah, right here. This I, is honestly, draw. I honestly hadn't thought about it, but now that you say that, I, that I probably <laughs> would like to draw that. I actually did draw yeah. Batman like that once. Um, yeah. I did a, uh, years ago, I did some sample pages just for my portfolio of uh, Batman and the Golden Age Sandman with the gas mask. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I, I like had it set in 1920s Chicago or something. And at the end, Batman reveals himself and I gave him the sort of kind of clunkier cowl and the sort of like more fabric looking suit and stuff. And that, that's fun. That's fun to draw. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Um, the other the other only other thing to really mention, I think, is uh, uh, Billy West does the voice of uh, Mo, Lair and Kerr, the Joker's. Mm. Three Stooges influenced yep. henchmen. henchmen. Yeah, but uh, yeah, that's that's it. Yep. I, I don't know if there's a, a a ton to really talk about this episode, honestly. Yeah, um, I did like that they put the stacked deck, uh, the the evil the bar the pub that by the pub by the docks that all the bad guys go to. It's the same pub that uh, 
Harley and Ivy went to, or it was either maybe it was Batgirl and Catwoman. Um, but we've seen the stack deck before. Oh, sure. Okay. Yeah. 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 I think I threw that into White Knight somewhere. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Um, I'm glad that they didn't use the Creeper as a main uh, member of the Bat family. Yeah. I think I, I would have like got tired of him really. Quick. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I didn't love the voice actor that they got for him. Uh, when I realized that they were trying to make him like Jim Carrey, I just felt like the voice they picked for him wasn't doing the heavy lifting that it could. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that he was supposed to be corny, and there was a lot of the episode winking at you. Like, it knew what it was doing, you know? Um, yeah, yeah. I don't know. It's kind of hard to rate this one for me. Yeah. Um, I'm going to give it a three because I think it uh, – it tells a pretty complete story for the most part. Like you, you yeah. get a pretty good sense of of who Jack Ryder is. Uh, once he turns into the, I mean, the creeper doesn't really have a lot to him other than like he's just trying to get back at the Joker, I guess. And he's also crazy. But yeah, and at the end, His motivation is weird. It, they didn't ever describe how he got these superpowers, did they? Eh, you know, it's just the the acid, I guess. D right. Different, different kind of acid, <laughs> slightly different, different, uh, different mixture, different formulation. Yeah, all right, I guess so. Yeah, I they, uh, yeah, it see it. This seems like the kind of episode where they were just having, they having fun with the character. Um, like yeah. I, I put this in the same boat as the, the demon within, where it's like, yeah, let's throw this other character in there and have some fun. Use a, uh, di in this case, a Ditko character instead of a Kirby character. Um, mm, yeah. But yeah, I think it's a it's a fun fun episode. Yeah. Cool. Uh yeah, I'm going to go with 3 as well. Um but I think to some people this might be a 4. Yeah. Yeah, but, it uh, gets Yeah, it's just not my Go ahead. It, I was just going to say it gets tough with these episodes because Batman ends up so much in the background. And yeah. so the creeper himself is is doing the heavy lifting and then Batman just kind of shows up at the end to wrap things up, which, you know, yeah. it, it, sometimes I, I don't think they all have to be Batman centric, off, obviously. Uh, yeah. But yeah, yeah, I, I don't know. I guess I just don't really love the creeper. <laughs> you know, if they if I wanted to make this a four or five, I think my approach would be let's lean into the Joker versus Joker stuff. Let's get. Let's have Batman out of the story even more and make it a Joker episode sure. with Harley. And there's a, some fight with him and Harley. And then there's this new Joker out there somehow. And she's sort of torn between the two of them. Like, I think, and you could still have the, the silly gags and all the fun stuff too. Um, but have it more focused, be more focused on Joker and his insecurity. Hmm. Uh, and play it less for laughs and more for like slight introspection. But not too heavy. You yeah, know what I mean? yeah. I think I think that would be fun if you because the Joker early on in the episode after the Creeper shows up, like his, like I said, his thing mm -hmm. is he's like, find out who, find out who's stealing my act, and then he just sort of disappears. Yeah, he doesn't have much action activity. He doesn't take much action. I feel like he would go after this guy himself. Yeah, yeah, and then like so, if you have the two of them facing off in in a in a Joker off or something like that, I think yeah. I think that would there's a lot of room to do some. And then if you have Batman on the peripheral being like, "What is going on?" Yeah, exactly. That would be the comedy. If Batman is like, "Do I just let these two destroy each other?" Because they're they're sort of ignoring me, and uh, like you see Joker focus on taking this guy down, and like it takes a lot to get Joker to really focus on something other than himself and Batman. Um, the fact that he's so threatened by the creeper and, you know, Joker pulls out a gun, the creeper pulls out a bigger gun that he stole from Joker. The Joker tries plan a, the yeah, it's, creeper it turns, tries better version, it, you know, he's it like, just turns his... into a uh, itchy and itchy and scratchy cartoon. <laughs> yeah. I just, I, I love, I love the idea of Batman responding to the scene of, of these two busting each other up and just looking around and seeing the streets covered in rubber chickens and like fake chattering <laughs> teeth and stuff. <laughs> Yeah, um, yeah, that would be really fun too. Yeah, 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 that's really good. You know, yeah, that's definitely a three now because now I'm imagining <laughs> this episode as a four or five, and it is way better in my head yeah. than what I just watched. Yes. <laughs> um, and uh, the the only other thing to mention, I think, is uh, the guy who did the voice of the creeper in this, um, whose name is Jeff Bennett, actually does the voice of the Joker in Batman: Brave and the Bold a few years later. Okay. Yeah. Oh, and the go. thrift store manager is Elizabeth Daly, who is the voice of um, uh, uh, Chucky on 
uh, Rugrats. Oh, I wanted to mention that character. I'm sorry, Tommy the... Pickles, not Chucky. Tommy Pickles. Tommy. Okay. Yeah. Our, uh, there, there's this point where the uh, creeper goes into a thrift store and everyone runs out scared, except for the cash, the cashier, mm-hmm. and she's just. She's just seen it all, I guess, and she's just sitting there like, "Yep, green's definitely your color. You're gonna that could be cash or credit." Uh, and she's sort of like, I mean, imagine how exhausting it must be to live in Gotham, and you can just tell this woman has <laughs> had it. Like nothing can show up in that store that's gonna freak her out at this point. And I love that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's the one time that a new character goes to the thrift store instead of going to the brand manager, I guess. Yeah, yeah. I've got a lot of brand manager questions for you regarding the next oh, episode. Oh, me too. By the way. Oh, so trust get me. ready. <laughs> trust me. I was thinking about it. <laughs> and uh, she's also uh, she plays Dottie in Pee Wee's Big Adventure, uh, Pee Wee's uh, friend slash love interest. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that was actually directed by Tim Burton. Yeah, it was. Yes. Unlike Nightmare. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. Quick side note: Wh- Who did direct Nightmare? Uh, Nightmare Before Christmas. <laughs> Just, uh, the fact that we don't know is such a shame. I know, and I watched the entire uh, movies that made movies us, that made us, and the and whole thing—the whole thing talks about how it was not Tim Burton, <laughs> and I still don't remember. It, I didn't even finish that one for some reason. I was like, "Yeah, like my heart wasn't into that one." Yeah. I'll watch all of it. It doesn't matter if it's a bad movie. I feel like the behind-the-scenes stuff is fascinating, but for some reason, that episode I just never made it through. Because I was like, oh, there's not a lot about Tim Burton here. Oh, well, I guess I'm done. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was uh, Henry Selleck was the director okay. of Nightmare Before Christmas. Oh, actually, uh, uh, he's a cousin of Tom Selleck. Are you making that up? Yes. Yeah, that's what I figured. I mean, it might be true. I don't know. Who knows? <laughs> uh, it's he, just crazy how all the... So, Denise Crosby is related to Crosby from Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young. No, and there was like, that's not true. It's Bing Crosby. I thought it was. She's, I believe she's Bing Crosby's daughter. I was going to mention Bing, too, because Bing came on my radar the other day, and I thought, are these Crosbys all related? Uh, I don't think David Crosby is related to the to Bing Crosby. but I uh, thought Tasha Yar was related to Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young Crosby. No. Nope. All right. Well, you know, you are... Oh, wait. I'm sorry. Hard. Hold on a second. I, it's... Uh, granddaughter she's she's Bing Crosby's granddaughter no as far as I know no relation to uh, David Crosby okay right I'm not gonna push back I mean you obviously know a lot about her never mind never mind they are related (laughs) hold on a second so I knew this was true and I was waiting for you to figure it out (laughs) what are you reading Wikipedia Wikipedia Uh, hold on a second here uh, no, no, I think I'm. I think I'm wrong here. Hold on a second. I swore it was Crosby. Hippie Crosby. Okay, let's see. David Crosby. Uh, wow. Uh, some of this is going to get edited out. I would assume. No, this is all staying in. <laughs> according according to Wikipedia, David Crosby is not related to Denise Crosby. Denise Crosby is the granddaughter of Bing Crosby. Oh, so you were right. Apparently, I think so, yes. Okay, congratulations. Thank you. (laughs) Another one on the board. I swore. Yeah, I swore. Yeah, right. (laughs) Uh, uh, Eventually, I'm going to win one of these. Don't worry. (laughs) I just, I'm not the archivist you are. I don't, you know, my my shit, my energy is spent in production, not collection. Yeah, and you just, you know, you say incorrect information just very confidently, and that gets you through. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) It's all about sales, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, I downloads? mean, like, who gives a shit? I don't care if they're related. It doesn't doesn't affect me at all. <clears throat> Did we have any? Uh, <clears throat> so we we recorded the, the thing about me in Marvel Comics. Did you post that yet? Uh, this will be posted. I believe that will be posted by the time this goes up. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I'm wondering what kind of uh, reactions people will have, or and where they'll be reacting, or maybe there won't be anything at all. Yeah. Who knows? We'll see. We'll find out. Where that's the, that's the fun of recording these things so far ahead. You don't necessarily know the uh, yeah yeah uh, the outcome. We're actually really far ahead on Star Trek at this point, so huh. I've actually lost track of what episodes are coming out when. And so right. we have a new one pop up, and then people are talking about it on our Discord, and I was like, I've, we did that like two months ago. But that's <laughs> we recorded it two months ago. But now it's only coming out now. Yeah. Um, cool. So do you want to move on to the next episode? Because I'm pretty much out of ideas. For yeah. Creepers. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And well, we spent half of the time arguing about <laughs> Crosby. <yeah. laughs> 
Well, the Crosby lineage must be archived <laughs> correctly. Uh, we're going to take a quick break, and we'll be back with uh, Judgment Day. Okay, Judgment Day, written by Rich Fogel and Alan Burnett, directed by Kurt Gaeta. And in this one, when a new vigilante uses lethal force to battle Gotham's criminals, Batman must figure out his true identity. That's a pretty short summation, but it's I wouldn't call it incorrect. Um, yeah, this is the one, finally the one that in my brain for a long time I got mixed up with Mask of the Phantasm. Yeah. Because they are kind of similar. Uh, at least in the idea of this sort of shadowy vigilante who's even more hardcore than Batman. Yeah. Um, and so I remember in my head years ago being like, oh, Phantasm, that tur- that's Two-Face, right? It turns out to be Two-Face? And like, no, that's that's this episode. Yeah. I, uh, right, I'm right out the gate. I'm going to say uh, I wish that they had drawn or animated um, the judge differently i wish they had used more smoke and mirrors and made him more of a phantom mm-hmm. and less of a guy walk walking around blackface in a robe and a giant well sword. let's I mean, let's be specific here he's not in blackface <laughs> that was a joke <laughs> i know <laughs> i just want to make sure i just want to make sure everybody is clear <laughs> um side note easiest character ever to draw oh probably. yeah yeah big time <laughs> just as long as you get the wig down and the the, the sword, I think you're golden. Um, yeah, I felt like they really went all in on his theme song, um, on the choir that they hired for the like creepy ghostly voices every time he showed up. Mm-hmm. But when they animated him, he was just like, "Yep, just a guy here standing on a bridge with a robe and a sword." Who loves puns? He makes lo- oh so God. many puns in this, which I can appreciate because yeah. I love a good villain pun. But man, mm-hmm. who knew that? Two Face's third personality was such a jokester. <laughs> That's the thing is like with the puns, he becomes less scary. So I feel like this, they needed to take another pass at this character to make it work for me anyway. Yeah, I I actually really like the story. I I think the the mystery is actually pretty well done for the most mm-hmm. part as far as how they uh how they lay out how judge could be two-faced but also have trapped two-faced i I like that crossover Mm -hmm. pretty well i liked um i like steven weber as the uh the the creepy da who's who's working with the 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 judge um that uh, voice actor was in phantasm too he played gil uh whatever oh really had had a crush um on uh, Bruce Wayne's ex-girlfriend or something. Oh, yeah. He was a councilman before. Like, I was actually thinking, even the way that they're animated looks the same. I thought this was a throwback to that character, but maybe not. Is it not, is it not the same character? Let's see. Uh, his, I know his first name was Gil in Mask of the Phantasm. Uh, uh, no, in this one it's J. Carol Cochran is the character's name. Yeah. I mean, good voice actor, but I'm surprised that they reused him relatively quickly i mean maybe they already paid him and they're like well well i mean actually we can get another episode out of this guy let's just cast him as the other councilman it technically wasn't that recent because this was 1998 and phantasm was like 1994 or something like that oh oh yeah so it was a it's a, a decent amount of time has passed between the two that's why they just reused the whole concept for this episode yeah no one will remember that movie yeah <laughs> i actually uh i've come to recognize i can i i steven weber has a really recognizable voice but he pops up to me a lot more now because i'm i'm in the middle of listening to the audiobook of stephen king's it that he does uh-huh. he narrates and he's fantastic he does a really yeah. really great job so his his voice is just ingrained in my brain now so he pops up a lot a lot clearer yeah i am um, i'm kind of impressed that i would love to know what the process is for getting people in to do Mm -hmm. these episodes because like the Riddler is in this. He has literally Mm. one line and they still got John Glover to do it. (laughs) They, this, the Riddler's cameo in this is further evidence that they don't know what the fuck to do with Riddler. Yeah. The Riddler diddle, diddle, diddle something riddle. Yeah. And he's done. (laughs) And his design is just so terrible. It's, it's it's such a bad redesign. Yeah. But like, I, I actually, um, in the last episode, I, I think I is it uh, no I guess it was this one, um, but also in the last episode too. I uh, before it got going, 
I saw that, uh, Harley only had like half a line or she just kind of like made a joke or something or like a, a noise. And I was like, oh, it sounded a little bit different than Arlene Sorkin. I was like, oh, maybe they didn't get her in to do like the one line Harley has. But obviously she has more lines than this. And yeah. then uh, in this one, at the beginning, I actually thought it was Kevin Conroy doing Killer Croc's voice because mm. uh, it's it sounded like Conroy to me, but it's not. It's it's the other guy. He does have more lines to, to uh, yeah make it makes sense yeah. to actually hire the guy to do it but i don't yeah i don't know why you like yeah did is it worth the gas for john glover to drive to the studio to do <laughs> one line if they for all the live in la yeah if he's just calling it through the phone like i forget what show they just had voice actors just dial in and they recorded them through the phone because the recording technology got so good that's what i think the simpsons guys do now i think they all do okay. it from their house yeah I think I might have heard that from you, as well as my when you would misinform me about the Crosby lineage. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder, since it's such, since it's just a single line, I wonder if that was pre-existing yeah. dialogue from another episode they didn't use, and so they <laughs> they just had him randomly talking to himself, and while he was warming up, once he was like "t to the toe to the tum," riddle diddle diddle, something, yeah, or something, maybe like yeah, perfect. maybe it was just a line that they cut from a different episode or something. I don't know. I, I, I yeah, like I. I just can't wrap my brain around the time and effort it would take to get someone in yeah. to do that one line. Right. Yeah. Um, I uh, got to uh, take a moment to give my uh, friend and art dealer, Jeff, a shout out because uh, for my early birthday present, he sent me a video of Kevin Conroy reading from Batman White Knight. Um, I posted it on Instagram and I, I showed you all in our text thread. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, man, I, I mean, he was reading a line where Batman was talking about how much, um, uh, Batgirl and Robin meant to him. And, uh, it was a line that I remember struggling really hard to get right. Cause it was like, Batman doesn't talk a whole lot in my book. And I really had to say a lot with, you know, just a few word balloons mm -hmm. and hearing Kevin Conroy read it. And like, I don't know if he practiced or what, but he nailed the timing, the inflection, the pause, even when he finished it, he had that thing where he nodded to himself like, and scene, <laughs> whatever that thing is that actors do, you know? And I was so impressed. And I, I, I'm like, man, this is nuts. I never thought I would, you know, my childhood Sean is, is peeing his pants right now. Mm -hmm. This is amazing. And then I was like, does he even know that I'm a Batman writer and artist? Like, did Jeff, did he even have contact with my friend Jeff? Or is this going through like, you know, uh, a secretary or, or some kind? And uh, apparently Kevin handles his own... Uh, discourse and he uh chatted with jeff for a bit and uh he knows who i am i guess which is amazing and yeah man um thinking ahead if they ever do a batman animated off of white knight i, I think i am going to try to talk to kevin and see if i can get him to try to get uh harleen sorkin to come back yeah Sorry, i always Arlene. i always wondered why she stopped doing it i mean maybe she just didn't want to do it anymore when they started doing other yeah. stuff but yeah she doesn't do it outside of the the animated series yeah. does she no, I mean, I don't know what else. She's, she's married to the guy, I think his name is Christopher Lloyd, who, not the one you're thinking of, he produced uh, Cheers oh, and sure, Frasier. Sure. Yep. And she was actually in the final episode of Frasier, and I'm a big fan of Frasier. Um, and uh, I don't know, it seems like they've got all the money they need, and they just are happy being retired. But if you came to her and said, listen, I don't know how you're feeling about where Harley Quinn went, but there's this book out there where Harley is now like a mom, and she's gotten over her insane obsession with joker and she's sort of you know you know going through a whole new arc right now and it's like a very new thing that harley is doing and i'm not sure if this would be the thing that might get you to come back just for a little bit you can get on the phone we don't have to fly you anywhere you literally call the Warner brothers office we will record you for two hours and you'll be done yeah you know yeah. like we'll take that we don't need you to do much for this i wonder if there's a way to spin that to get her interest or if she's like retired forever retired yeah you know? i don't know the the last thing that she did uh was in 2012 in a DC Universe online game where she did the voice of Harley. Uh, yeah. She was on Days of Our Lives uh -huh. for a while, for a long time. Uh, wow, 428 episodes. Jesus. Wow. <clears throat> it says that she did the voice of Harley in Arkham Asylum, but I thought Tara Strong did it in that game. Anyway, how many Arkham Asylums were there? Uh, this is the one from 2009, so that's the the first. Yeah, the first Arkham Asylum. It says it was her. Uh, yeah. Maybe Tara Strong did the next two. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, it, if she was doing Harley as recently as 2012, it's you know it's possible you might be able to get her. 
Yeah, I mean, it's not up to me at all, unfortunately. Sure, sure. It's just, like I said, from time to time, if they make a cartoon, they're just going to run it through the mill. What I think and say probably won't, they won't care. Yeah. Um, it is what it is. It's fine. My Well, my favorite voice in this episode is the voice of the judge, because I didn't recognize the voice, but the name mm-hmm. rang a bell to me. So I looked him up, and it's a guy named Malachi Throne, and he actually plays my favorite villain in the 1966 Batman show, which is a character who only shows up for one, two episode thing called False wow. False Face. Unbelievable! <laughs> my favorite, my favorite villain. It, it's he's kind of hard to describe, but he's kind of like uh, uh, the chameleon, the Spider-Man villain. He he mm. wears, you know, those creepy like uh, translucent masks where they're like clear, sort of clear plastic, and they've got like garish yeah. makeup on them and like a big smile and stuff. He yep. wears those over his face, so he's got this really kind of disturbing look to him, and he's he's just this over the top uh, master of disguise who like, hmm. you know, they do a scene with Commissioner Gordon, and Commissioner Gordon's acting kind of weird, and then he reaches yeah. up and pulls his face off, and it's false face with that creepy mask underneath. He's I I uh-huh. I had never. I did not remember him from when I was watching the show when I was younger, but I just recently was watching through the first season, and his episode came up, and I was like, I don't know why they didn't use this guy all the time. This guy's amazing. Yeah. So the the effect you're talking about with the plastic, is that like um, F- Fury Road, the bad guy, was it Toe Cutter or whatever, who had that like translucent uh, thing he was wearing? Yeah, he had like a like a chest piece that was like that. Uh, oh, it wasn't on his face. No, as the, well? the thing on his face was okay. like a, uh, uh, like a breather. Yeah, I mean, I'll try and uh, find a picture before I send it over you. Um, yeah, no, I, yeah, that's a cool effect though, especially for like a pretty creepy effect in the '60s. You know? Yeah, I mean, for it's a, super cheap generally too. A family show. Yeah, I actually don't. If I remember correctly, I don't think his name is listed in the credits or something. Where because like they, you never see his actual face, and so they is that supposed to be toe cutter? Like, didn't they get a famous actor from Mad Max to come back for that role, or did I? I'm sorry, I was talking. I was talking about Batman again. Oh, sorry. Okay. Uh, but uh, yes, the guy, the guy in Fury Road is Toe Cutter from the original, original okay. uh, Batman. I just sent you a picture of that, the mask that yeah. I was talking about. Yeah, I got it. Okay, that's not as creepy as I thought, but I bet when it's in motion, it's more creepy. Yeah, they, and they he they has like a bunch of different ones that he wears and stuff, and it's it's kind of a it's a pretty unnerving unnerving thing. Yeah. Anyway, he's yeah, the voice cool. of the judge. Uh, pretty pretty good voice actor, I think. That the uh, he he delivers puns very well. So uh, I gotta say though, the judge has got a lot of neat toys. Oh yeah, I mean he's got giant handcuffs. He seems like he's mostly depleted the section of the uh, the uh, brand manager hooked him up with all the different weird handcuffs you could imagine. Whether it's like big scissor handcuffs, yes. m- m- uh, magnetic handcuffs, not to mention the sword. And a few other things. But what did you think about all that? I, I think that uh, uh, once <laughs> once Lockup ended up getting caught at the end of that episode, he didn't come to pick up a lot of the stuff that he ordered. So he's, it's, it's, it's in the cheap bin for this new guy if he needs something. I got a bunch of handcuffs, a bunch of law-related items for you to choose from. Did he show up as Two-Face? Or Great question. Show up. Great like, question. I think you, I think you're gonna need a third. Uh, I, I think maybe there's a room here for a new personality for you. What if what if it what if the whole thing was Brandon's idea where he was like, "Listen, Harvey, you've been coming to me for a long time. I've been ordering two of everything. You're helping put my son through college. I really appreciate it." But you're literally paying twice as much for everything yeah. because l- let me look at you, right? But what I'm thinking is my favorite customer. What I think you got to do is add a third customer. Like he knows to go back to the well. And he knows that he can get Two Face to spend even more money with a third personality. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> He's a great salesman. Like, He's a great salesman. He is. He knew. He sensed the money right away. Mm-hmm. He saw a target. He sensed a whale, and he took him down. Yep. And that's why he gets most of his money out of Two Face. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He he knows how to he knows how to repurpose stuff that people don't come to pick up and sell it on to the next guy. I think the judge just. He got that like Goodfellas new money thing where it's like he started being this character, his profile starts getting raised, so he just keeps going yeah. back to the store and just keeps buying stuff. Every time he shows up in this episode, he's got a new gadget. 
So he's just yeah. he's just blowing the money that he's got. I don't know where he's getting money from, but he's blowing it. Like when he when he captured Two Face in his own lair, and he had all these like me- me- mechanical metal doors shutting. I'm like, wow, that's a lot of funding and preparation. Is that all the brand manager? And then it's revealed that he just hacked into Two Face's system. So I'm like, okay, well that makes more sense. But overall, I was impressed with the amount of equipment that the judge had for a brand new villain. You <laughs> yes, know? you know what I like about you, Judge. I like that you put your money into practical gadgets and not henchmen because henchmen are unreliable. You know it is reliable, a set of magnetic electrocution-based handcuffs, which I have yep. two of, and you can have them both. Yep. I consider my henchmen lost leaders, let's be honest. 401ks, insurance. I lose money on every henchman I sell. But fucking, but magnetic handcuffs come to the right place. I mean, like, what's, what's really going to net him the most profit? Is it going to be selling four cheap costumes or Mm -hmm. two pairs of really expensive magnetic handcuffs. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, it all depends on the markup and how much you had to pay. That's true. Uh, I'm not paying retail for no magic handcuffs. They got to be, you know, I got to, everyone's got to, I got to make a little money here too. Right, right, right. You know, you got to keep the lights (laughs) on at the brand manager's place. Do you think the brand manager is a big fan of like American pickers? (laughs) (laughs) I think he would be because I think he does. I mean that's a big part of his that's a big part of his business plan is is uh, is uh, real estate yeah hit, and hitting up yard sales and and people who default on houses and uh, uh, storage units out by the swamp he's like bidding on that shit like crazy or does he have a team of people do it yeah I mean he walks he walks over to a building and he's like you know if you put a giant uh, smiley face on the front of this I could get at least four people to buy this by the end of the week. <laughs> I made most of my fortune uh, on a show called Storage Wars. <laughs> I took all the unused merchandise. <laughs> um, you know, my fa- my favorite part about this episode, and it's one of those those little animation things that it's like it's like in The Simpsons. If you see Homer yeah. Homer wearing a watch, it's only mm-hmm. because at one point in the scene he's going to look at his watch because Homer doesn't never wears a watch. But if for the for the what's necessary for that scene, Homer needs to be wearing yeah. a watch. And as soon as he looks at the watch, the watch just appear, disappears. Right. And this one, I'm going like, why do they keep <laughs> focusing on these two tiny keys dangling from the judge's wrist? Yeah. And then it's like, oh, so Batman can use the keys to get out of the handcuffs, which I still don't understand, because he right. uses the keys to unlock the ankle cuffs, uh-huh. and then the next shot is him using one free hand. To yep. unlock the other hand. It's the magic of editing, Clay. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> and I like the way he inserts the key. He inserts it from a weird, strange angle and almost like pushes a button inside the thing to get it to unlock. Not to be super picky. But... Yeah. Well, I just like that for a high-tech pair of magnetic electrical uh, handcuffs. It still works on a simple key system. <laughs> it still needs a skeleton key yeah. that George Washington himself would recognize. Yes, yes. <laughs> uh, you know, I want to show... The best way to introduce the brand manager as a comic, I know we were going to try to work him into um, the Jason Todd thing, mm-hmm. and it didn't quite make sense. Should I just pitch a brand manager two shot? Should it be in the main line with DC, or should it just be in the White Knight universe? And like, what's the best way to to handle this, honestly? Because I feel like this would be an Eisner nominated idea <laughs> that no one would see coming, except people who listen to this, of course, because we're all cool. Uh, I, I could see it going either way. I, 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 like the, I like the idea of having the control over him in, in the White Knight universe, but, I mean, we're, yeah. we're, I, is there a White Knight universe that is open to the brand manager at this point, unless we start going back in time? I think we do a two-episode, two, sorry, uh, com, you know, 48 pages or whatever, and we just make the brand manager the main character, and Batman's trying to find this guy, and he's realizing that all these resources, like it's meant to be kind of ton, tongue-in-cheek, mm-hmm. It's supposed to be a lot of fun. You get a lot of fun cameos from over the years as the brand manager starts building his empire, meeting like a, uh, a Two Face before he became Two Face, yep, yep. Clay Face. You know, all before people really got geared up, and he saw that there was a market potential here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and then at the end, of course, you know, Batman catches him or he escapes or whatever. His daughter takes over the Brandy Brandanowitz takes over. <laughs> uh, but I feel like DC will be like, "What are you?" Are you serious? Like, you know, White Knight is such a grounded, uh, you know, distillation of Batman's history. You really want to do like a tongue in cheek 
type thing. But at this point, like, I don't think they would say no to anything I pitched as long as it's sold. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Is it better to do it there? Or if I go, hey, guys, if you ever have a two issue gap, and you want me to write for detective or like a mainline, you know, whether I draw it, I don't know. But I would definitely love to write a script about a character. It's going to be perfect for a quick fill in. And I think it'll get a lot. Of, I think it'll be like a character that people think about from years to come, you know? Yeah. Like, do I want to blow that on the main line or do I want to use that for my own shit? Yeah. That's a tough call. Yeah. I think it could work either way. Um, yeah. I, I think probably the, it, the benefit of white Knight is that you, it maintain, you can, we can make sure it, it, it stays in the universe yeah. and kind of really have control over it. But yeah. the mainline one does have the the uh, a mainline fill-in does have the benefit of being like oh this is just the next issue that people pick up and oh yeah. this is not what I was expecting but this is kind of fun you know what I mean like it, right. it, if if it's a mainline two issue thing then it just sort of becomes part of the run but if we're doing a, yeah. a forty eight page one shot then then that becomes like the thing you have to yeah. sell you know right well the the problem though <clears throat> is they're gonna say they're going to get excited like yay sean murphy's coming over to do some detective and but the thing i do is not what they want me to do right, like, they'd rather right. have me do like an eight issue arc or something something more substantial it'd be like me being an amazing lead singer and then they're like oh really you're gonna join uh, led zeppelin for a song that's gonna be awesome and i'm like no i'm gonna help the band by loading the truck yeah. <laughs> i'm not gonna get on stage <laughs> you misunderstand me yeah yeah <laughs> i only want to help a little bit and then get off stage yeah i i uh selfishly would want to keep it in the white knight universe because i think there's so much uh yeah. untapped room in like yeah. year year wise as stuff as far as like the stuff that hasn't been covered in there that you could really yeah. have a lot of fun with yeah i think it would be white knight yeah i think that's what i would do i think if i ever did mainline <clears throat> i would uh get uh, neo joker in there i would make it so that they can't ignore the fact that there are two harleys in sort of yeah, you know, drop that seed in the main line. Just see what writers do with it. Yeah, yeah. I have a, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, I have a weird theory that I was thinking of recently, and uh, I wasn't planning on talking about this, uh, but I feel like because my stuff has done so well, a lot of the other writers working now in comics don't want to use my stuff because they're like, "Fuck him!" Like Sean is working without a <laughs> network. We don't see him in any of these parties. We're sort of annoyed that he won't draw our, our books and he this artist thinks he's a writer. He's just doing gimmicks. Like I know that that opinion exists in a lot of writers working at DC. Marvel too, obviously. I think the people that are going to embrace uh, Neo Joker is the eight-year-old or 10-year-old reading it now who's like, one day I'm going to get it in the comics. And like, remember that old story that Sean did sure. with Neo Joker? I'm bringing her back. Like I feel like I need to flush this, wait for this generation to move on and then the next generation comes in who grew up as white knight fans sure to like introduce these ideas like i'm waiting for the scott snyder or james tinian who's 10 years old right now yeah i need him to i need to fast forward into the future where he's now writing batman and suddenly i get a phone call and he's like it's happening we're bringing neo joker <laughs> in man i've been a i've been a fan of yours since i was a kid yeah yeah definitely. but the current amount of writers i just think they're hesitant to work in any of my ideas and uh it, things are weird at dc and in comics overall right now so mm. it is well it is. i don't want to make any assumptions about anything because i obviously don't what? i don't know how anything works over there but i did <laughs> I, I did find it interesting that a couple years after white knight that character punchline started showing up yeah which is i'm not going to say is it's not an exact copy of neo joker but it's in seemed to be in the same vein yeah uh, so it, is. It, it just i just thought it was an interesting coincidence yeah it is. I mean, the idea of uh, another Harley, I can't be the first to have come up with that. There had to be people who were circling around that idea. You know, mm -hmm. no one just, no one pulled the trigger before me. So, uh, you know, I'll give James the benefit of the doubt because I think Punchline did really well for him and I like James. Yeah, so, yeah. I like that I character that. too. I think it's a cool character. Yeah. Yeah, honestly, like I feel like Punchline is a better name for her than Neo Joker. I, I <laughs> still hate the name Neo Joker, but I didn't know what else. I ran out of time, and I'm like, "Fuck it, this is the best we got." So, I need to have like a renaming contest. Or you suggested calling her Riot, which I think was brilliant. Oh, sure, yeah. After the that line in the in the in the issue, yeah. Yeah, the line that you gave me, just for, to give credit where credit's due. <laughs> <laughs> Normally, when I get your notes and you you feed me 
here's maybe we should try instead. I don't want to use what you said word for word because right, right. I just don't think that's right. But every now and then you nail it. And I'm like, fuck, like, dude, I'm sorry. Like, can I just use what you wrote for me word for word, please? <laughs> that's fine. That's fine. And I think like twice I had to do that. And, uh, you know, of course, I'm always giving you credit for it anytime I can. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, right. Yeah. Ba- sorry for that tangent. No, that's fine. Um I uh, were, were you as confused as I was when they said uh, they needed to send people to Cobblepot's design studio? Oh, I missed that. Yeah, what, what is that? The the place where the penguin is at the beginning, where uh, the judge first shows up. When uh-huh. they when the the cops or whoever I, I can't remember exactly who's talking about it. They they ref they refer to the place that they're in, which seemed to be a place full of like parade floats or something. It, it, yeah, giant typewriter and a yeah. A, they refer to it as penguin on wheels. They refer to it as Cobblepot's design studio. So I don't know if that is is su- supposed to imply that the penguin is yeah. the one designing all these gigantic oversized props or what. But <laughs> I tell you, if he tries, you know he's going to shut him down I, as the brand I sure manager. Do. Well, I don't know because I mean, <laughs> someone's got to build them, right? Brand manager's not building them. He doesn't have the infrastructure in place for that, nor does he want it. Frankly, well, he's like, I'll tell you what I'm doing. I'm playing the long game. He thinks he's a he thinks he's a competitor. I'm gonna let him believe that for a while, but eventually I'm gonna get him arrested. And I'm gonna take his stuff for free. In fact, he's gonna pay me to rob him. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's the game brand manager would yes. play. He wouldn't do a direct combat head to head thing. He would go through the backdoor means. Oh, yeah. Sabotage penguin and then take all of his cool yeah. shit. I really like the idea that the brand manager is by far the smartest villain in Gotham City. <laughs> yeah. I like the idea of his dad being a uh, unhappy props manager at a, a dying uh, theater oh, company. Oh, sure, sure. And he's like one of those guys that gets mad at actors because, you know, actors, uh, they don't ever respect a crew. The crew does all the hard work and the heavy lifting. These fucking actors never respect us. And uh, that's kind of where the brand manager starts to, you know, build his psyche on. <laughs> yeah. And see what makes him what makes him smarter and more capable than all these other villains is that he doesn't have an agenda. He doesn't he's not insane. He's just yeah. about the bottom line. All he's trying to do is provide for his yeah. family and make some money. And he's yeah. he's he's doing it because all these other people are insane and willing to throw yeah. a lot of money at stupid shit. Maybe the button at the end of a brand manager would be Batman arrests him. They put him in jail. Uh, they wheel, they, they take him to his new cell and they lock him in a cell and suddenly he says, nice try. And the cell, uh, detaches from the building and drives off. Like he (laughs) built his own set ahead of time perfectly and the guard lost count at how many, he went way too far down the hallway where a cell shouldn't be. And that's what the brand manager designed. And that's like him getting away or whatever. You know what? That sounds like something (laughs) false face would do. So I'm, I'm on board. (laughs) No, but I I like the idea that Batman can't get him because he's technically not doing anything wrong. You know, like he has he That's has true. his his infrastructure set up so that none of this stuff can really come back on him. He's just he owns right. a lot of properties, but he's not I don't know yeah. who's using the stuff and what they're using it for. It's just it's not my fault it burned yeah. down. It's not my fault right. Batman showed up and destroyed it, but I will yeah. I will collect on the insurance money. Right, yeah. Like Batman shows up to Arkham with the brand manager handcuffed, and they're like, "We can't put him in here for jaywalking." I'm sorry. Right, <laughs> he right. He needs to break a real, a bigger law. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm picturing like, a, like a scene in like The Untouchables or something where they, where they, where Batman confronts him on the stairs of his building, and he just yells and yells in Batman's face that he's never going to get him because he's got nothing, nothing. Yeah. And then it's the nerdy guy who uh, is going to take him down using the IRS. Yes, exactly. Yes, that's how you get the brand manager. You get him on tax yeah. evasion. But I feel like he would have that cover too. He's like, you don't think I saw that movie? <laughs> you don't think I saw that coming? Just, I did. I'm the Bobby De Niro, but I, I did everything right. Yeah, yeah. He bu- his one his one uh, his one vice is that he buys too many boats <laughs> illegally, and that's how they end up getting. Him. <laughs> Yeah, he goes. Maybe he like, goes hunting without a hunting license. <laughs> he got he caught a fish that was too big yes, and didn't throw yeah. it back. <laughs> Batman's like on a boat next to him with binoculars, like in the middle of the daylight. You can totally see him, by the way. Gotcha. <laughs> but he's so angry that he can't take this guy down. <laughs> it's like when Houdini was trying to disprove these seance people that he started like 
uh, fabricating evidence just to take them down. He was so obsessed with taking down seance people because he knew it wasn't true mm-hmm. that he would actually bend the evidence in order to expose them, which hurt his own case. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you're aware of the Houdini stuff. Oh, yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah. Man, well, that was a good uh, 10 minutes on Brandman. Yeah, I mean, at least we have this on record <laughs> for when we eventually have to write it. <laughs> did you see the new uh, Batman trailer that came out yesterday? I did, yeah. I, You know, it's weird. Everybody was going crazy over it. I am yeah. very much looking forward to the movie, but yeah. uh, I don't know. The, tra- it, the trailer was just kind of fine for me. Yeah. I like the car porn in it. Yeah. You got some nice uh, car action of it blasting through, a, a, you know, jumping through an explosion, of course. I like the, you know, the rally car vibe mm-hmm. that he's got. And uh, yeah, just for the car stuff, I liked it. I didn't really love the trailer from two months ago, so I thought this one was better. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what makes you think the director is going to do a good job? Like, what is Reeves' history here? Uh, Matt Reeves did Cloverfield, and he did yep. uh, the American remake of Let the Right One In, which is called Let Me In, which is which is very good. He also oh, yeah. did... I only saw the original. I didn't know that they redid that here. Yeah, yeah. I think it's I think it's really good. I like it a lot. Uh, it's, it's a very close remake. Like, it's a very almost like a shot yeah. for shot feeling remake but i think the the way that right. they handled it was was really good he also did the cool. uh the second planet of the apes movie not rise of the planet of the apes but the one after that the first one where it was like you know mm-hmm. post apocalypse and they're fighting each other and stuff which was great he did the yeah. out of the 3 he did 2 and 3 i haven't seen 3 yet but i heard it was pretty good but yeah, yeah he's just he's a he's a really good director who's been kind of flying under the radar a lot for most of his career it's got to be frustrating for both him and Fukunawa to have these like locked and loaded tentpole hits, Batman and Bond, and to wait two years sure. for these fucking things yeah. to come out. You know? Yeah. Uh, same thing happened with Halloween. Halloween was supposed to come out last year and only came out this past Friday. I got to see that. Yeah. Did you watch that yet? Not yet. I'm going next week. Yeah. And Ghostbusters, too. Yeah. Ghostbusters was supposed to come out last year. Yeah. I'm waiting for that one, too. Um, did you uh, see the movies that made us? The one about R- R- RoboCop. I did not watch that yet. No. Oh, no man, it's it's pretty good. You'll like it. Yeah. I mean, you probably already know most of the stuff in there anyway. Yeah, you know those shows. I think we've mentioned this before, but those that show specifically always has something that I didn't know. Like you know, you, you think you know everything about a movie you really like, and then they talk to someone that no one's ever yeah. talked to before, and then you always get some <laughs> yeah. you always get some good uh, nuggets out of it. Like the director yeah. when they talk to the actual director of Nightmare Before Christmas, and you learn some real interesting facts about the movie. When they show a picture of him, and you're like, "That's not the director." Yeah, that's not, no, that's, not that's not Tim that's Burton. Not Tim Burton. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck him. Uh, no, they talked to uh, um, John Landis. And uh, for not not uh, RoboCop, but for um, is it Friday the Thirteenth or Nightmare? Uh, good question. Or neither. I, I don't know. I don't know what he would have to do with either of those movies. No. What was the? Oh, was it? Shit! It wasn't RoboCop. It wasn't Aliens. It wasn't. Uh, ah, man, I'm fucking this up. I can't remember the new episode. They just released like six new ones or whatever. Yeah, I don't know. Oh, was it uh, Coming to America? Yes, I believe. I think he directed that. Okay, got it. And this was right off the heels of the helicopter crash or whatever. Oh, sure. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, that got dark. Uh, Did they talk about that in the in the thing? Yeah. Really? They talked about how he was really pissed off because he still had to stand. He had to go to trial for that. So for people who don't know, there was... He, what movie was he shooting, Clay? Uh, Twilight it was Zone. A Twilight. Twilight Zone episode, and they had a real helicopter shooting in Vietnam, and there was a problem with the helicopter, and the pilot and two kids were killed no the, uh, uh, the, it wasn't the pilot it was the uh the two, the three actors on on the ground it was uh vic morrow and two young kids so the right the, yeah the helicopter came down and the blades hit the three of them yeah all right um so they had to do a it was like a trial and for 10 years he had this or a matter of time i don't know how many years it was he had to go and stand trial and he was eventually acquitted he was the first director to ever be charged with a homicide uh, on a movie set mm-hmm. or something like that. Um, and a lot of his friends in Hollywood would not vouch for him. And uh, people who you think are your friends, the minute you need them, where are they? You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So he was going through that. And I guess Eddie Murphy was a guy that stood by him for a while. Um, but then they had another falling out while they were making Coming to America. I don't know why I'm telling you this on a Batman <laughs> podcast, because you can all just go watch this yourself. <laughs> Sorry. 
There's uh, there's actually a really good uh, similarly to that. There's a really on Shutter. There's a show called Cursed Films that they talk mm. about movies that you know uh, people say that they're cursed, like The Exorcist or Poltergeist yeah. or something. They did one on right. they did one on the Twilight Zone, uh, talking primarily about nice. that, and it was really interesting. It was it was pretty it was a tough watch, but it was. Uh, yeah. If you want, if you want to see the uh, the other side of that story, I would I would recommend watching that. I imagine that they'll get around to doing Batman eighty nine movies that made us. Yeah. Right? I yeah I would hope so. Yeah. Maybe they're waiting until. Did you see the Flash trailer? Yeah. Yeah. I I don't care about the Flash at all, but I'm there all day for Michael. Keaton. Yeah. I the rest of that movie is kind of a hard sell for me, but I'm you know I'm I'm there for the Batman <laughs> stuff. I. Which yeah. I mean, maybe that just makes me a huge mark. I don't know, but they're yeah. gonna get my money. So you you put Bruce Wayne in there. You got Keaton. You should get him in a bat suit or have the old suit in the background. And if you show the '89 Batmobile, I'm fucking happy. Yeah, I, I, I did see it all day long. I did find it a little weird because you know you you see certain characters and the things that they're in, and and they kind of have their own. There's a certain uh, border of of things that get into their their universe you know what i mean and yeah. to hear michael keaton's voiceover in that thing be like you can travel to any time or to any dimension or any universe i was like that's that's yeah. weird to hear him say that because that's not the kind of batman that he was yeah. yeah but whatever i'm here for it but i i, I felt like it did sound like his version of bruce it Wayne. did yes like I, it all came back to me and that, that sounds like what that version of bruce would say yeah if he was given this, you know, science fiction type scenario, whatever the hell's going on. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know, man. I mean, it's funny because they've uh, fumbled so long with Batman and JLA and all these characters. It's too soon to bring back Christian Bale. The Joe Schumacher stuff is still, the, the residue is still honest. The the clearest hit they have, the biggest wild card they have is Michael Keaton. Yeah. yeah. Um, who we all, who they sort of forgot about for over a decade, it seems, or at least or two decades. But you bring him back, you offer him like a Batman Beyond movie, slam fucking dunk all day long. Oh yeah, you know. Yeah, and I think these guys are smart too. Like I, I, yeah. I I'm pretty sure Michael Keaton was always thinking, you know, I got Batman in my back pocket. When I feel yeah. like when I feel like it's time, I'll play that card and I'll make a shitload of money. Yeah. <laughs> you know? The same with but Picard. It, it, like yeah, I mean it was. Pro- I mean it's obviously a. a smaller amount of time yeah. between roles of playing Picard but yeah. he's always had that card he could play if he says I True, want to come back yeah. and play Picard they're not going to say no if they had a string of hits with Batman and they never drop the ball even if the Batflex stuff worked out if this uh, new one works out if they had hit after hit they would tell Michael Keaton sorry we don't need you probably or yeah. we want you but you're not as important to us now because they're on their knees he should be asking a whole lot more yeah yeah yeah, yeah. If I was his agent, that's what I'd be saying. I'm sure he's getting plenty. I, <laughs> I'm sure yeah. they're paying. I mean, quite he a must bit. be. Michael Keaton must know what Batman Beyond is, right? I don't know. It's a good question. I would love to know if he actually. Someone must have said, "Hey, bro, you know what you need to do now that you're old and gray. Check it out. This is cartoon. Like he must be aware of that show, right? I, that would be insane if he didn't know that. Yeah, I, I hope so. I mean, if if yeah, that would be. That's that's the that's the money right there is is a Batman Beyond movie, but if yeah if I met him and I said you ever heard of Batman Beyond he's like what I would look at his assistant and punch him in the face <laughs> like how did you not let this guy know that there's this perfect role for him right right I'm your new assistant I'm gonna get you this role yeah 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 the 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 thing about this this episode that I did like a, a little bit more of a serious note we don't have to talk too long mm-hmm. about it is there's always this idea when it comes to vigilantes, that eventually there's going to be another vigilante who is doing things more extreme than the first vigilante because mm-hmm. the first one isn't getting things done. So you've got yeah. you've got the judge in this who's taking these cri- these criminals down a lot harder than Batman does. Uh, yeah. In the Dirty Harry movies, the second one, I think, is called The Enforcers, which is about a, a bunch of rogue cops who are actually literally just going around killing criminals um and it's 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 always been an interesting i mean even to a certain extent that's what asriel is doing in in curse of the white knight right mm-hmm. would you say yeah, yeah. It, it's yep. it's always been an interesting angle to me because it's it really it really does ask where the line gets drawn 
because yeah. you've already got someone who is breaking the law in order to quote, you know, uphold the law to, or something. And then yeah. where I, what is the line that is being crossed that makes this next round? It's usually murder, right? It's mm. usually people mm -hmm. who are just killing uh, indiscriminately. <laughs> well, or killing people specifically, but just killing without any sort of. Uh, due yeah. process or anything but i yeah i yeah. always find that plot idea very interesting because it does make in the best versions of it it makes the first vigilante kind of get a little bit introspective and be like am i really doing the right thing if this is the kind of thing it's it's inspiring yeah yeah you know i was thinking about that because i'm doing kurt uh beyond the white knight right now and i need to have a scene where bruce talks about that stuff like how does he feel seeing gotham fixed now that after Azrael killed them all mm -hmm. You know, like, yeah, killing is, you know, like that is wrong, but it did work, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, saved a lot of lives possibly by just taking them off the map. Like, yeah, morally reprehensible, but practically very profitable in a lot of ways, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. very, um, you know, that's not the right word, but you know what I mean? Um, yeah. And like, wh what does Bruce think about all that? And uh, I, I need to have a scene where probably Harley digs into him and talks about that stuff and you know joker's relation to all of it and all that like bruce probably has a lot to say about that you know he saw asriel eat his lunch basically and everyone thinks that asriel is this fucking hero because he did what you know bruce would only go 99 percent of the way and asriel went to 100 right and asriel ended up being this this weird savior and not bruce wayne right which really must fucking bother him you know what i mean yeah and i think you've got some interesting stuff working there too because you kind of have both sides of the equation both extremes because on the other side you've got you know stop me if this is giving away too much but you've got yeah. dick Go ahead. you've got dick who's all in with the militarized police at this point who is yeah. swinging that pendulum all the way in the other direction and how yeah. does how is bruce dealing with that and and seeing the other the, the stuff the stuff that he's uh, he's uh, the reaping of the stuff that he sowed on the other side of the equation, you know. Yeah, yeah, it'll be interesting because you have it's one of the things in the book will be Dick versus Barbara. So you have good cops versus bad cops. Mm -hmm. You know, Barbara's traditional GCPD. Dick runs the GTO. It's, it's too, the funding is exp crazy expensive to run. It's vigilantism. It's just creating the same problems that Batman created all over again. But Dick doesn't want to admit it because he's just pissed at bruce um and uh yeah you know bruce is kind of caught in the middle of this situation that he sort of helped create um but it's also a good re good way to talk about good cops and bad cops because i know a lot of writers want to talk about <clears throat> blm and george floyd and cops are bad and all that stuff but i did want to sort of have a book the batman a batman book out there which does talk about the reality of a lot of cops are good and they don't like bad cops either and sort of comics I don't think is going to do a good job balancing that discussion, but I, that's why I want to jump on it. Mm -hmm. um, just to see if I can handle it. Yeah. We'll see. <laughs> um, we'll see. Yeah. If it doesn't work out and yeah, <laughs> we won't be doing Batman <laughs> beyond podcasts or anything. <laughs> um, uh, and I actually talked, I was, I was in New York at, a, at the show. Uh, first, first big convention back to life, by the way, yeah. I'm so happy to see that the convention stuck with it, stayed the course and pulled it off just to show people, look, we did it. We checked vax cards you know the creators that canceled i think in hindsight they wish they didn't and you know i respect why they chose to not go but i'm really glad that the first big comic show got off the ground yeah yeah no it's, it's great yeah the uh, um i'm hoping to to get back to normal doing them next year uh yeah especially because my book will be out um next month mm. and uh, there's not really there there's emerald city but I, I've, I've decided i'm not going to do emerald city this year um but next year, I'm hoping to to get back in the swing of things and and start getting out there and uh, and pushing the book mm -hmm. and and talking to people again. Will it not be out by Emerald City? It will be. It'll be out uh, November seventeenth, I think, and Emerald City, I yeah. think, is December second. I wish you would go, man. Yeah, I, I know <clears throat> it's personal choice and all that, but I, I wish you would go. Yeah, I it's yeah, it's just not something I I feel comfortable doing at this point. Yeah, that's fine. In a way, I wish you had tried New York just so you could see how it works now and be like, "All right, this isn't so scary." Maybe no, it's maybe no. I, I don't. Yeah. I don't doubt that at all. It's just I. It's it's a number of a number of reasons, not just that, that I've decided not to do it. Yeah. Yep. You got your book in Diamond, though, right? Yeah. Yeah. It'll be out in in all stores in November. 
Awesome. Assuming people, assuming stores ordered it. <sighs> assuming the industry hasn't collapsed by that. Right, right. <laughs> Uh, the the only other thing I wanted to mention in this one is I, I actually do like it's it's a it's it's a little bit too easy but I do like the little bit of detective work that Batman had to do to figure out who the judge was and it also mm-hmm. kind of falls into the brand manager riff we were going on because it's like, he starts off and he's got this giant hammer which is an award that he won so it's just something he's got lying around the house and then <laughs> yeah. as he goes on he gets cooler and cooler uh gadgets now that he's his his cred is going up and he's got a little bit of cash to throw around uh yeah. but i i do i do like the idea that they find him because this mallet is a is a trophy and there's like a uh-huh. limited number of people that won this trophy and that, that's it's a it's a fun little bit <laughs> and the cops did not see the four holes and put the pieces together right yes the way the plaque used to be yeah i thought it was like oh i feel like the cops would have caught that too but it is a kid show so yeah makes sense um what would you draw on this one um, you go first. I haven't thought of mine. Yeah, I just I didn't have a really good one for this. I uh, I think I might draw. I'm gonna be really lazy and say that I would draw the opening scene with Penguin mm-hmm. and Two Face and Killer Croc doing that deal for the diamond or whatever. Just because yeah. it would be, I think it would be fun to draw all those villains at the same time. And you could, you know, if you throw, I guess you can't throw yeah. the judge in there because the judge is Two Face. But <laughs> yeah. Yeah, um, I think I would draw the judge just in a more creepy, yeah. uh, grandiose way. I, I thought his presentation was kind of ho hum, and I feel like you really could have done a Phantom of the Opera type, really t- play with um, lighting and the smoke and mirrors, so to speak, like uh, Kelly Jones style oh, yeah. or you know totally. Safino, whatever. We should we talk about Kelly Jones a lot, and I feel like most people don't even know who he is. Maybe we should take a whole episode and talk about him. <laughs> yeah, I would lo- I would love to talk about Kelly Jones. Kelly Jones did some of the most. He did. He probably had the the biggest influence on me, like without me even really yeah. knowing it, because uh, right. the the covers that he did during Nightfall in the '90s were yeah. just some of the creepiest Batman covers I've ever seen, and they really stuck yeah. with me as like this is the dark scary version of batman yeah yeah he's really great it's funny i i uh i have the trade that you lent me still where it's uh bane breaking batman's back which is a classic cover but the more i i i pass by it on my way into the office the more i'm like that's not very good like that's not his best work at all the way that batman's back it's just like the i know it was a last minute cover and uh he wasn't supposed to be the artist to do that it was some kind of a quick oh really i didn't know that yeah, he didn't have a whole lot of time to prepare, from what I understand. Um, but, I mean, I've seen a ton of great work from him. Uh, he did a great series about it's a Batman Halloween-type book that came out like 10 or 15 years ago, which was awesome. Oh, sure. Um, but, yeah, that Bane cover is not his best work. But I get why it's obviously, you know, a milestone. Yeah, I, I, I love the other ones he did in that that run. Like, uh, there's, there's one with um, Batman is like opening up a basket full of snakes and the Joker's head is popping out and then behind him is mm-hmm. Victor Zaz with a knife about to stab Batman in the back. It's really cool. Yeah. He's got a cool Scarecrow one where it's like, I think it's Batman's like that massive insane cape that he always draws that doesn't really make any like anatomical sense. Yeah. is just out and yeah. flowing. It's so cool. Yeah, the way he draws the cape, it's like ribbed Yeah, with yeah. the... Yeah tendons inside the 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 cave it's it's nuts what we should do is we'll make a pay for it podcast we'll just talk about our top five batman artists and just go through them one by one and spend like 15 minutes on each one yeah, i think that would be something people w- would be into because i could say i could talk all day about toth and zafino and these other guys that contributed to batman yeah absolutely yeah i think that would be a lot of fun um, um what would you rate this one um i don't love this episode yeah uh, I'm between a, th- a, th- a th- I guess I'm gonna go three, but a low three. Yeah, I, I'm gonna go three as well. I think the the one of my I think probably my biggest problem with this is that it it suffers from the same problem a lot of them did this season where it just ends very abruptly. I think the end yeah. works out pretty well because I like that bit in Arkham when Harvey is putting himself on trial. Right. That that's that's pretty cool. Uh, but it does have a really tidy wrap up where they just knock him out pull the mask off and then batman is like you see 
he yeah. had created a third personality and blah blah blah. And yeah. It's like okay, okay, sure, but like you never get you, Harvey never deals with that at all. You never get a, a scene of him recognizing yeah. what he's doing. I think there's more more there that you could could dig into that unfortunately yeah. they don't have to, they don't have the time to do. It's it's unfortunate because this was the last season of the series, um, and they had a handful of stinkers right at the end. Uh, of course, I've, Mad Love is an all-timer for me, so I'm glad that they ended with that one, sure. or that one was near the end, depending on your, your countdown. Um, but it just feels like they were cleaning out the offices and just sort of like taking care of things as they went along. Yeah. Like, well, this is the end. Like, It just didn't feel like they were taking it as seriously as they did the first three seasons. You know? Yeah, a, lo- a lot of them do feel like that, especially the ones with these like, random side characters like the creeper or the demon or yeah they all just kind of feel like yeah what the hell we know everybody they, exactly you know they feel very throwaway. yeah we've wanted to use the demon everybody loves kirby we love the demon let's do a demon episode you know yeah but. <laughs> i actually do like that one <laughs> but yeah the other ones <clears throat> excuse me yeah the other ones definitely feel a little little vapid yeah um but i don't know i mean they definitely focused on um the Dark Knights one with who has the Frank Miller in there, and they right, had, uh, right. they, they, you could tell which ones really stood out to them. Like the, again, the one where Batman has got the fear toxin, where he's not giving a shit anymore, and he's more dangerous oh, than yeah, ever. Yeah. I love that yeah. one. <clears throat> I love Over the Edge, of course. Like there are some of the best episodes in the series are in the final season, but then there's the other eighty percent, which are too short, too quick, too throwaway, right, right. too much about a random side character that we never saw or hear from ever again. Yeah, it's just you know, they really could have up their game if they had done an episode about false face <laughs> yep but they didn't it's their own fault false face does show up on brave no. and the bull yep. a few years later which is fun but uh cool yeah i would love to do false face and i don't know if false face transfers as well to the page as actually it does in in movies and stuff but yeah it's a it's a yeah. fun deep cut character and i like the deep cut characters so for our next episode i think we should do the um world's finest four episodes um where Batman and Superman are working together. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Uh, and then we should do the one episode that Batman is in, in the Superman series, where Superman is pretending to be Batman for the whole episode. Oh, sure. And it is brilliant. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah, yeah, we can do that. I think we'll do... Uh, this is the end of the series, as I said before, the end of Batman the Animated Series. So I think we're probably yeah. going to do a, ra- a series wrap-up where we can just sort of mm-hmm. like uh, talk for a bit about our impressions about the the show as a whole. Yeah, and then yep. uh, yeah, we'll probably take some time off and then come back and do those, and then uh, th- that'll take the place of where we usually do the the movie in between seasons, yep. and uh, then we'll yep. come back with uh, Batman Beyond. I I, do, I feel I feel like we've talked about this before, but should we do Batwoman Mystery of the Batwoman? It's it's technically <laughs> part of the thing, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we should be complete. Yeah, I guess we should. And uh, unfortunately, do that one where Harley is farting in the back of the Batmobile uh, that when they came out relatively recently. Yeah. Well, if we'll do it in chronological order, so we won't have to do that for another twenty-five years. Okay. Hopefully, <laughs> we'll die of COVID before then. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, I think that's gonna do it. Uh, thank you guys all for listening. Thank you for sticking with us for four seasons of Batman the Animated Series. Uh, if you want to catch up with that. Uh, Marvel episode that Sean mentioned uh, earlier, you can find that on our Patreon, which you can get to at patreon.com slash the Penske file. The Penske file is sort of the uh, uh, podcast network umbrella that we that we exist in, which covers our mm. Star Trek podcast, our uh, horror movie podcast and everything in between. There's a lot of stuff on there in the from the seven years that we've been doing this. Yeah. Um, but yeah, thank you guys, everyone for listening. Uh, thanks for supporting the show. Thank you, Sean. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Clay, for uh pushing this and being the recording guy and you know this really is your effort more than mine i'm just sort of here to, to along for the ride but you're doing all the heavy lifting including editing out dumb things that i say <laughs> <laughs> well you. i i appreciate you being up for doing this because i think it's been a lot of fun and uh, it's you know at the very least we got a uh a, 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 an all-time character that we're going to put into a batman book at someday that will definitely won't just be in one <laughs> issue and then never brought up again in the history of the book yeah and the, the other weird thing I mean, what started off as a silly podcast about the cartoon turned into, hey, I'm doing a book called White Knight, which is going to come out at some point. And, hey, that book is a, a, a huge hit. And a lot of the uh, ideas that went in, like you can hear about, at least from my end, 
a lot of my insecurities through the entire process sure. of this weird ride that has been White Knight. And it's all kind of documented here, um, including, you know, stuff like the brand manager and getting you to help with Jason Todd and the future of the book or whatever. Sure. Like, there's a lot of good... Inf- this isn't just the Batman animated series podcast. There's a lot here, but it's so disorganized that I don't think... It- it'll be hard for a biographer to really suss it all out. Yeah, <laughs> you know? once you make it through the hentai stuff, then you get to the, <laughs> the good Batman You know, info. you should just... You should just isolate the hentai part and just have that be its own thing. Because I feel like people are like, it's not very well marked where the hell that episode is. That's the fun of it, though. You know, it's you can't you you got to search through the podcast until you find the marble and the oatmeal. You know, it was season. What season was it? At least I think season one I or think, two. I honestly don't remember. <laughs> Maybe the first one. I think I'm going to say season of... one because I think it was the Clayface episode. Yeah, there was. Now, I only got through half of my rant, by the way. Like, there's a lot more to that well that I didn't even get into about why hentai confuses me. Yeah, well, <laughs> join us in a couple months for uh, Hentai <laughs> Beyond when we'll be talking all about the rest of Sean's opinions about hentai. There you go, man. All right. Uh, thanks, guys. Thanks again for listening, and we will talk to you soon. Bye. <laughs>